this morning is what is the canon of scripture and how did we get it? And to start with, most of what I'm saying this morning comes from two teachers. I'm, I'm, I'm reading to myself. Am I reading to y'all? Uh, it comes from uh, two teachers. One is Brian Edwards. He's a speaker with Answers in Genesis in England. And Hannah wanted me to use his British accent when I did this, but I can't do that. And Mike Winger, I don't know if you've heard of him, but he's a great guy. He uh, graduated uh, school of ministry at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. So he's affiliated with Calvary Chapel. He's a really great guy on all of the stuff that I've seen. So most of my stuff is coming from those two teachers. I'm sure that you've heard that shortly, so within a few hundred years after the church was started, a group of bearded old men sat around in a room deciding what book's going to be in the Bible and what book's going to be left out of the Bible. And based on their biases and conspiracy theories, there were some books that were left out that should have been in there. But is this really true? See if I can learn technology. All right. Definition of canon. The word comes from two words, a Hebrew word, kana, which is a rod, and the Greek word canon, which is a reed. They refer to a measuring rod or a ruler, and it can also mean a rule or a law. And it is a standard by which things can be measured. When we use it to describe the Bible, uh, we use it as a, we say it's a collection of books, which we call the Holy Scriptures, and it is a standard by which we can be measured which makes me wonder if that's why the skeptics are continually trying to discount the Bible and thus discard the standard by which we're measured. All right, there are two ways to look at the canon of scripture. Is it a authorized collection of books or is it a collection of authoritative books? And this is important because if it is an authorized collection of books, that gives the authority to the person or the church that determines what's in the Bible. But if it's a collection of authoritative books, then it is, given, it is a collection of books given to us by God, making His the authority to which we submit, and it is His holy word. So let's start by looking at the Old Testament for a minute. By all indications, the Old Testament books were accepted pretty quickly after they were written. Um, you're not going to find any Jewish person that would say the books of Moses were not God's word or any of the prophets because they knew whether they liked it or not, they knew what the prophets were writing were from God. Um, and repeatedly the text would say, this is the word of the Lord. When we get to Jesus' day, you see Jesus and the apostles all quoting the um, Old Testament scriptures as it was, scripture. And never once did you see anyone go, well, wait a minute, that's not in our scriptures. They just all knew it was scripture. So the Old Testament, there's not a lot on it as far as the canonization, but it was accepted as scripture very early on. When we get to the New Testament, we didn't have the church fathers sitting around going, all right, Jesus has already come, so we need to come up with us a set of scriptures. That's not how it happened. What did happen is the early church they did recognize that some of the writings from the apostles were from God and on the same level as Old Testament uh, scriptures. And let's look at the criteria that they looked at when they were determining this. They looked at, was the writing apostolic? Meaning, was it written by an apostle or by someone under the teaching of an apostle? Was it accepted? Did the early church accept it as scripture early on? And on a side note for that, you may hear skeptics claim that early on there was a debate amongst the church as to you know, what's on, a debate amongst the, in the church as to whether some books should be accepted or not. And these books were James, Jude, Second Peter, Second and Third John. There's five of them. And it is true that it did take a little bit longer for these books to be accepted as scripture. The issue was, it wasn't that they were considered heretical. But as the church got older, farther from the original apostles, there was some question over were they really written by who it was claimed to be. So the younger church was hesitant to accept them, just basically they wanted to make sure, did John really write John? Did Peter really write Peter? So that was the hesitation. But these books did end up getting accepted as scripture. But what this shows us is how seriously the early church took was it written by an apostle uh, very early on? 
To continue, the book had to be authentic and accurate. Did it conform to what the apostles had been teaching, and was it true? And was it ancient, meaning was it accepted very early on by the church in general? When we look at the New Testament, we see that the writers of the New Testament wrote with confidence that what they were writing and teaching was from God and was God's word. They referenced each other's writings as scripture on par with the Old Testament. In 1 Thessalonians 2.13, Paul writes, We also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. Uh, 2 Peter 3.2, Peter writes, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. So right there, Peter is going, hey, what I'm telling you is on the same level as Old Testament scripture. In 2 Peter 3, uh, 15 to 16, Peter also writes, Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. So we see that the apostles recognized each other's writings as scripture. But did the early church accept the writings as scripture on par with the Old Testament? Many old church, uh, early church fathers, and I'm not talking about early Catholic fathers like Augustine, but the early fathers like uh, Clement of Rome, Polycarp, who sat under John and Ignatius. They heavily quoted uh, what we would consider the New Testament and referred to it as scripture. There was no debate on was this scripture or was this not. They recognized it as scripture, they quoted it as scripture, they, expect, they expected their readers to understand what they were writing with scripture. Just as when Pastor Brian throws up the meditation verse or whatever, we know that scripture. And they accepted it the same way. There was no question. And if there was any writings that did not meet the above criteria, it may have been a good teaching, but it was not accepted as uh, scripture. And if anything was heretical, they strongly came out against it. Uh, there, on my research, I read there was a guy, Marcion, that he was teaching some stuff that was heretical, and they, I think they ran him out of the land. Um, so knowing that, they're, that they accepted certain books, the ones we have now, and rejected others, like the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Mary, the Gospel of Judas, was there an official list of what was Scripture? As we've covered, the early church just accepted the Gospels and, and the rest of the writings. And there was no need for a list uh, until uh, false gospels started popping up and heretical teachings started popping up. That's when they started collecting lists of this is what is scripture. By 175, 175 AD, we do start seeing some of these lists. And by the end of the 200s, the list closely matched what we have today with the exception of those five books that were in question. Uh, but by the mid to late 300s, what we have now was consistently on the different lists is this is what scripture is, this is what we're recognizing as scripture. And there were no councils sitting around determining what should and shouldn't be in the Bible. As Mark Winger puts it, they, the church, they were not making scripture, they were just acknowledging what is scripture. So what about the councils we hear about? It seems that a lot of the time, at least when I've heard this, you know, they'll bring up, well, there was these councils. They always bring up the Council of Nicaea. The interesting thing is the Council of Nicaea didn't even discuss the canon of Scripture. They were there to address a, a heretical teaching that was creeping into the church, and the teaching was some guy is trying to say that Jesus was a created being. And that was the primary focus of the Council of Nicaea. The council that did make an official list was the Catholic Council of Trent in the mid-1500s. And this council was brought together in response to the Protestant Reformation. And they did set forth the list of this is what scripture is. And they added to it the Apocrypha because they needed the Apocrypha to support some of their teachings. And in doing so, they, the Catholic Church claimed the authority 
to determine what scripture was. So what about the other books and the banned books? There were other books that were known during that time and were used, kind of like we would use commentaries today, but they were never recognized as scripture. Clement wrote a letter to Corinth, I think it was around 95, he wrote a letter to Corinth, and apparently they were still having issues. Um, and this letter was considered instructive, but it was never considered scripture. There was something called the Didache, which is basically a starter kit for new Christians, just giving them basic instructions in Christian living. It has stuff like if a traveling pastor comes and stays over three days, or if he asks for money, kick him out because he's a false teacher. Um, but once again, it was helpful, but it was never considered scripture. And there were many other letters that the church fathers were writing to the different churches. Uh, they were helpful, insightful, nobody ever considered them scripture. Now when we move to the banned books, the interesting thing that when the skeptics bring up all the banned books, they never mention any of the books that I just listed. They always want to bring up the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Judas, the Gospel of Mary. Those are the books that the, the fathers kept out through conspiracy or whatever. And the best way I know to handle these books, these banned books, is just to give you a few quotes from them and let you decide if you think they should be in Scripture or not. So the first one is from the first quote is from the Gospel of Mary, and I quote, Peter said to him, while you are explaining everything to us, tell us one more thing. What is the sin of the world? The Savior answered, there is no such thing as sin. You only make it appear when you act according to the habits of your adultered sin of your adulterer nature. That is how what you call sin manifests. On par with scripture, right? The next one. This is from the Gospel of Thomas, which is the go-to. This should be in the scripture. Now, the Gospel of Thomas is about 114 sayings, um, kind of like Proverbs, just different sayings throughout. So you ready for this one? Okay. See, let's see how this stands. Jesus said, blessed is the lion that's been eaten by a human and then becomes human. But how awful for the human who's been eaten by a lion and the lion becomes human. <laughs> All right, I'm saving the best for last. Now this one is subtle, so pay very close attention to this one because it's very, very subtle. All right, this is from the Gospel of Thomas again. Simon Peter said to them, Mary should leave us because women aren't worthy of life. Jesus said, look, am I to make her a man so that she may become a living spirit too? She's equal to you men because every woman who makes herself manly will enter the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> I, mean, I think we should stick there right there between Luke and John, right? Get some Tom, uh, Thomas 114 tattooed. No. So you can see that when the skeptics bring up these arguments, they're either showing their ignorance or their bias because there is no way any rational person can read any of this nonsense and say, yes, that's on the same level as scripture. So to finish, what we have is a canon of scripture which was accepted as God's word very soon after it was written. There was no council that determined what was and wasn't scripture and what should be in the Bible. And the banned books, we see there's no way they could be true, true scripture or from God. Now we already have the links to those two teachers. We have like five videos and several articles, way, way more in depth than what I just covered. This is just barely scratching the surface. But I would highly encourage you to go check it out because there are some great, great resources there.